Okay, I think let's start. Okay. Good night, everyone. It's 8 30 p.m. in Iran, Thursday night. And thank you for it's a family time. Thanks for your time with us. Thank you, Dr. Nodus. Good morning to you. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Behad Nodus, my friend of 25 years. Uh, Dr. Nodus went to study medicine in Isfahan. And uh, after that, he started his PhD at IPM as the first cohort of PhD students, along with Dr. Ibrahim Pudu, Dr. Dr. Mirpur. And uh, he did his PhD about view center representation in IT courses in primates. And after his PhD in 2006, he joined Tree Moore's lab, first as a postdoc and then as a research associate. Uh, in his postdoc, he beautifully showed how the dopamine receptors in the frontal areas can influence the visual responses in the mid-level areas. In uh, 2013, he started his own lab first in the University of Montana as an assistant professor, and after a few years, he joined the University of Utah as an associate professor to continue his work on the contribution of the frontal areas in, in working memory and attention in mid-level areas. Uh, he's an alumni of IPM. Most of us work with him here, and he's supervising some PhD students jointly at IPM. So I should say welcome back home. It's great to have you here, and hopefully we will have you in person very soon. Uh, we are we are eager to learn what's going on and the prefrontal control of visual cortical signals. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for such a great introduction. Thanks again, everyone, for first of all staying here late at night, uh, uh, and also for people who has arranged the who have arranged the such a great conference. I mean, there is a great list of speakers, and it it was very nicely arranged and coordinated and managed without any glitch. Probably that was my first time having any online presentation to just log in there, connect, share my screen and everything is working. So <laughs> I should acknowledge that for sure. And uh, uh, <clears throat> also I'm, I'm honored to be invited by, by, uh, by this conference. So I, I want to talk about what, what's been going on in our lab uh, throughout the last few years in terms of understanding the neural basis of prefrontal control visual cortical signals. Uh, as you probably know, the, the question of how prefrontal cortex controls signals in back of the brain in, in sensory areas is kind of central to understanding cognitive functions. And the reason is um, most of these cognitive functions, say attention, working memory, decision making, they need to recruit sensory areas, they need to know what is going on in sensory areas and enhance the representation there in order to achieve our goals, for example, in a visually guided behavior that we want to uh, uh, make an eye movement somewhere or, or reach to something. This peripheral control of signals in visual areas is important for most of our uh, visual actions and visually guided behavior. And uh, particularly attention. So, so that is why the major focus is on what's going on on the prefrontal side when it involves in recruiting sensory areas during attention. So in order to start with a definition of attention, we can just start with, with a simple definition that attention is the process for selecting a subset of sensory information for further processing while ignoring the rest of information. So that's the practical definition that we want to start with. You can uh, see that there are multiple schools of thought that they approach attention from different perspectives, but it is important to note, okay, this is the way that we think of attention, that it's the capacity to enhance some information and let some other information go and ignore them. And I always use this 
example because it's helpful to give people that haven't heard my talk before to have an idea of how we study attention. So what I'm, what I'm going to ask you is to keep your eye here, keep your fixation here, and I present a set of arrays, uh, a set, set of letters, and you can probably easily tell me that there was an eye presented there because you were directing your overt attention by fixating there and you could process what's going on there. But if I ask you what was presented, for example, here, following if you haven't been in my talk before, you don't know what was that, what was presented there. But this time, if I ask you to keep your eye here, but mentally focus there to see if you can process what's going on there, I'll present the same array again. And hopefully this time you were able to notice that there was a P presented there, meaning that by directing your covert visual spatial attention, you could enhance the processing of a specific sensory signal at the expense of ignoring the rest of visual scene in order to process it better and to understand what's going on there. So this is the definition of attention that we use in, in, in our lab settings, meaning that we perform a similar task in macaque monkeys. We ask, we ask them to perform a similar task, meaning that they are sitting in front of the monitor, we put an electrode into visual area, say area V4 or MT, in posterior visual areas, we record neurons in those areas that we know that they have a specific receptive field, meaning that when we present a stimulus at a certain part of the space, these neurons respond to, so we define the receptive field of those neurons, we, we can present the stimulus inside and outside the receptive field, and, the, and usually in attention tasks, for example, classically, but what's been done by Moran and Zizimon, for example, is we ask the animal to change its locus of attention, we train them to switch between a stimulus that's inside the before receptive field that we're recording from or outside and this way we can see if there is a difference between the response to the same stimulus when animal is attending to it or not attending to it uh, in, in these two conditions. And, and by just keeping the same scene and changing the top-down signal of attended versus not attended, we can uh, study the neural correlates of attention in visual areas. Uh, so the idea is that these changes, for example, this stronger firing rate in visual areas in attention, uh, in attend in versus attend out conditions is a basis for a stronger signal in visual areas that generally enhance sensory representation and eventually to better and uh, more um, uh, utility for for that sensory information to guide behavior. Uh, also on the network side of the uh, attention control system, we know that there are a set of various areas involved in control of signals in visual cortex. Parallel cortex, peripheral cortex, subcortical areas uh, such as thalamus, uh, particularly the pulmonar part and supercollicus is involved are involved in changing uh, responses of visual neurons. The idea is that, for example, peripheral cortex is involved in keeping goals and uh, aims of uh, behavior and modulating sensory areas based on those goals that are kept in working memory and attention plans. Parietal cortex is believed to be involved in detecting salience of the stimuli and detecting what is what, what the stimulus is uh, is going to, to, to drive the behavior in terms of its salience and its uh, importance, its, its history uh, importance. Supercolibus is involved in uh, triggering, again, based on salience and uh, importance of sensory signals can trigger sensory information in visual areas. Thalamus and pulvinar is believed to be involved in coordinating these areas by letting information transferred and be communicated between these areas. Among these areas that are involved in control of signals, I'm focusing on peripheral cortex and particularly the frontal eye field part of that, which is a small area in front of the arcuate sulcus, as shown in this lateral view of a macaque monkey brain, uh, that is involved in control of eye movements. Since the studies in the 19th century, we knew that stimulation of FEF uh, and lesions of that area 
are associated with evoking eye movements or, or problems in eye movements. And what, uh, 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 what, what classically is done is that we place an electrode there, we stimulate the FEF with a small electrical current, say 150 microamp, that makes the eye move to a certain part of visual space, that we call it the response field of the FEF site, and uh, this way we can study a specific part of uh, frontal eye field that is, for example, processing this part of visual space with a, another part of V4 that is processing the same part of visual space, and I'll get to that that point later. But what is important is that what Tirin and Masala showed uh, almost 20 years ago was that the same area that is involved in control of eye movement, this frontal eye field area, when you stimulate it with subthreshold current, say if 150 microamp is enough to evoke saccade, if they stimulate it with 40, 50 microamp, then what happens is you get effects of attention. So what they did was they stimulate the FEF with 150 microamp, they made the animal to land its uh, saccade to a certain part of uh, visual space, they define the FEF receptive field and response field based on that, then put a stimulus there and the animal's task is to detect if this is stimulus when it's among other distractors, whenever it changes its luminance, animal has to press a lever there. And they show that when they stimulate the FEF with electrical currents less than uh, what is needed to evoke eye movement with these subthreshold currents, what happens is that Animals, animal is able to detect more subtle changes uh, in the visual stimulus as a sign of mimicking effects of attention, and this only happens when the stimulus is inside the FEF receptive field. So, by this electrical stimulation, Thierry Moore and Masala showed that the same area that is involved in control of eye movements, when you stimulate with subthreshold currents, it is also involved in evoking attention-like behavior, meaning that animal is better able to detect sensory changes appearing at that part of the space. So, FEF electrical sim stimulation improves perception. What we did uh, as the first step was, okay, if we know that FEF activity is linked to selective attention and sensory enhancement, and if we know that sensory enhancement, uh, selective attention is linked to increase of the neural correlates of attention, and a stronger visual response in sensory areas, what we wanted to know was what is the nature of signals sent from FEF to V4? What is the exact information that is carried by FEF neurons to V4 to let them strengthen their response and increase their response during these attention tasks? So what we did was we used a method that's called collision method. I'm not going to go through the details of that. We are uh, in brief, we are stimulating the V4 side and see if the spikes generated by the stimulation are going to collide with a naturally occurring spike on the FEF side of the, uh, the cell soma. And by, by finding this collision phenomenon, we can figure out which neuron is specifically projecting from FEF to V4 directly. And by studying those, uh, we can we can identify their their response. So so what we do is we place two electrodes there. We find neurons that are connected, and find the two areas that their receptive fields of V4 area and FEF area are overlapping with each other. And then what we ask is, once we find the connected neurons, we ask the animal to perform a spatial working memory task. It's called memory guided saccade task. This task animal fixates on a fixation point. There is a stimulus appearing in this overlapping part of the space between FEF and V4. Animal has to remember that location throughout the delay period and make an eye movement at the end of the trial to that remembered location. So the good part about this task is that it has so many important components of visual period, memory period, and motor period or eye movement period. And when when we have the animal performing this task and when we find a FEF neuron that is specifically projected to V4, now we can record their response in this, during this task. And here is a sample response of a neuron that is directly going from FEF to V4. And as you can see, it's responding to the presence of visual stimulus. Then during the delay period, during the memory period, there is 
is trying enhancement of response compared to baseline, but interestingly, during the eye movement period, the response drops down right before the saccad happens. So, and this was the pattern that we observed in a population of neurons that we found projecting from FEF to V4. What was interesting was the memory period activity was the most robust phenomenon that we could observe in uh, FEF neurons project into V4, meaning that all FEF neurons going to V4 showed such a persistent activity. Visual activity was similar to the general population of FEF. It was like 50% of neurons showed that. And motor activity was actually very underrepresented in the responses of FEF neurons going to V4, meaning that we did observe actually a drop of response in uh, response of FEF neurons going to V4. So the, the most robust part of response was uh, a working memory signal sent from FEF to V4 potentially to allow gating of signals back in visual areas. So that was the first study that based on that we understood that okay, the, the way that peripheral control of sensory signals is happening is by sending the working memory, but it's held in working memory. The, the plans of action that is held in prefrontal cortex is sent directly to visual areas, potentially to gate those areas. So if I want to summarize the first part, we found that FEF neurons with motor-related activity were rare among those projects into V4. FEF sends a strong, persistent signal during the memory period of the task, of a special working memory task to V4, and uh, FEF's contribution in top-down control of signals in visual areas seems to involve its visual and memory-related function rather than its motor function. So the final conclusion was this persistent activity sent from visual from frontal eye field to visual areas is the way that prefrontal, prefrontal control of sensory signals is going to be achieved. Now, the next question was that how does this working memory signal sent from FEF to V4 benefit visual processing. So what we did was we recorded in V4 and MT, both actually in two, two separate papers, and we showed that indeed in these areas when we record the same task, the memory guided saccade task, and record for example MT in this case or, or V4 in, uh, in another paper, we actually interestingly don't see that much of activity change during the delay period. So during the delay period of the task where this area is supposed to receive a strong working memory signal, there is no change in firing rate of these neurons uh, during the in versus out memory conditions. But what was interesting was looking at sub-threshold activity, the LFP oscillations, local field potential oscillations in uh, both areas of V4 and MT, we observed a strong power modulation in the alpha beta range of oscillation, as you can see in this figure, during the in versus out condition, the power of frequencies was much, much stronger in visual areas. Meaning that these areas do receive a signal relaying the content of working memory, but they don't show it in their spiking activity. Moreover, we found that SPL, the spike phase locking, the, the phenomenon that phase of, the phase that the specific spike, specific action potential occurs is going to be a certain phase of oscillation. This phenomenon was observed in visual areas as well, meaning that spikes were better locked to a certain phase of oscillation during this, within this alpha beta frequency range in in versus out conditions. And this also showed that, okay, whereas visual areas don't show change in their firing rate, they do lock their spikes to certain oscillations that are probably generated by working memory and probably generated by FEF. So that was the second step that tell, told us that these sensory areas are recruited by top-down signal from the frontal eye field, bringing working memory information, but they are probably changing their spike timing rather than their firing rate. 
then what Mohsen and Isabel has been uh, have, have been working on uh, Mohsen is, is in Iran and Isabel is the post in Iran lab was they've been recording in FEFM before simultaneously trying to figure out what is the source of the oscillations generated in V4. So by recording simultaneously during a similar working memory task, a similar MGS task, uh, what they found is that when, when they are looking at phase amplitude coupling, the phase of uh, FEF or V4 being coupled to what amplitude of uh, the amplitude of what frequency in FEF. What, what we found was the gamma mediated activity in FEF seems to be locked with the amplitude of gamma seems to be coupled with certain phases of uh, beta in FEF and a similar range say this is around 20 to 25 uh, in V4 it was around 17 to 22 so a very close frequency between FEF and V4 are coupled with gamma mediated activity in FEF. So, and, and we know that gamma mediated activity is believed to be uh, linked to uh, spiking activity. So, so the idea behind this result is persistent activity which is happening in frontal eye field is going to be uh, a source for oscillations both on FEF and V4 side in the alpha beta frequency range which eventually results in a phase phase locking PPL between the two areas so we can see that when we looked at V4 frequency and FEF frequency we observed a locking within this alpha beta range of oscillation between the two areas so that was the second in, uh, step for understanding what is happening between the two areas that so the first picture was FEF is sending a signal relaying the content of working memory to sensor areas the second step was we recorded uh, V4 and MT and we did not find changing firing rate we found change in oscillation but more importantly those changes in oscillation in V4 are linked to a specific amplitude of FEF in gamma range and also a similar oscillation is happening in FEF linked to the same amplitude of frequency as well causing the two areas to couple together. So the question that we had was is this coupling functional? Is it something that it matters for the behavior of the animal? So what we did with Ehsan uh, was we were looking at the key aspects of uh, neural responses between FEF and visual areas within, within each either of these two areas that are linked and that can predict the behavior. So, so we used an object working memory task because we could better follow the behavior in that case in terms of success of the animal for remembering a specific location or not, a specific object or not. So in this task, animal is fixating on a fixation point, stimulus is appearing inside the receptive field, the overlapping receptive field of FEF and IT in this case, infrotemporal cortex, and rem remembers the uh, identity of, of the object, and then makes an eye movement to, to show what the memorized identity was at the end of the trial. Recording both FEF and IT at the same time, you could observe what is classically known that in FEF, firing rate is increased when animal remembers the location inside versus outside of its receptive field. On the IT side, the difference between in versus out was not that strong uh, during the delay period, but what was strong was the difference between preferred and non-preferred stimuli for the IT that you could see that the information about these the identity of the object persists throughout the delay period so whereas the spatial information is preserved in FEF object information is preserved in IT but what was interesting was this spatial information or object information or specifically the, the firing rate of the neurons neither in FEF 
nor in IT did not follow uh, and did not predict the behavior of the animal. We did not observe any change in the firing rate of FEF or V4 nor, or IT neurons when we looked at correct versus wrong trials, when animal successfully remembered the object or, or if the animal made a mistake at the end. We did not observe a change in firing rate of the neurons. So the first step was what, what is the neural signature of successful working memory performance? And the answer was it is probably not the fire grade within an area. Then we looked at the power of oscillation. So this is the same structure that this is the Q period, sample period, and here is the delay period. We did not observe any strong change of oscillation during the, the delay period between correct and wrong trials, neither in FEF nor, nor, before, nor IT. So the second step was we did not observe power changes too. However, what was very strongly observed was there was a strong locking between the two areas, the same way that we observed in a uh, couple of slides ago, that during the memory period of the task, of that object working memory task. The factor that changes between correct and wrong trials is a specific oscillation, a specific coupling between the two areas that is happening during the visual period and continues throughout the, throughout the delay period and memory period. And that is the key difference between correct and wrong trials. And what was more important was that when we looked at Selectivity within IT, meaning that how much IT neurons are able to differentiate the sensory signals based on their firing rate, when we split trials into trials that there is a great locking between FEF and IT, that, that's a high PPL trial, we observe that the IT's ability to differentiate sensory signals is enhanced in those set of trials. If, if IT is locked with FEF, it's better able to discriminate sensory signals compared to the condition that the same uh, stimulus is there, same FEFIT are recorded, but the locking between the two areas is, is, is less. So, and, and this was only the case for PPL, meaning that we only observed behavioral uh, signatures uh, in uh, based on locking between the two areas, but we did not observe such distinction based on power of T or power of FEF. So if I want to summarize the picture so far is we found in the absence of firing rate changes, working memory alters LFP alpha beta oscillations in visual areas. Working memory induced alpha beta oscillations alter the timing of its spikes, and during working memory, Prefrontal and visual areas that we showed it by simultaneous recording of FEF and V4, also simultaneous recording and during a uh, spatial working memory task, which was this slide. And then we also showed it for object working memory, this is slide, that prefrontal and visual areas exhibit oscillatory coupling. And this coupling of sensory areas is the hallmark of successful working memory performance. So if you want to conclude uh, our, our findings so far, we can say that working memory sen recruits sensory areas by inducing LFP oscillations in those areas. And rather than maintaining the content of working memory in sensory areas, the purpose of this working memory signal sent to these areas is to bring about the benefits of working memory for sensory processing by making these areas exhibit their representation in, in, in their oscillations. And we are working on uh, the neural basis for that, what, what neurons are involved in, in, in this uh, generation of this oscillatory behavior, the benefits of coupling between the two areas in terms of gating working memory dependent information into behavior and letting sensory signals to gate working memory dependent behavior. So this is the uh, currently ongoing research in our lab. But I just want to put the results into a larger perspective so we can have a take-home message as, as well at the end. So 
if I want to put all these results into, into one, one single slide, we found that working memory is associated with enhanced signals in visual areas, which is the believed neural correlate of attention. FEF neurons carry a rich working memory signal from the FEF to sensory areas. And importantly, we know that before projecting, FEF neurons express D1 receptors. Dopamine uh, D1 receptors are generally expressed in these FEF neurons project into V4. And that's a paper that just recently published by Thierry and Adrian Muller in cerebral cortex that they showed that they traced FEF neurons going to V4, and they showed that actually these neurons do express D1R receptors. And now having this picture, it, plus knowing that dopamine through D1Rs modulates the persistent activity, it dovetails very nicely with what we found before, back in like, like 10 years ago with Thierry, that this FEF D1R mani mani uh, manipulations enhances the strengths of visual signals in visual areas, meaning that now we have a circuit level understanding of what's going on. There is a sensory, there is a working memory signal sent from FEF to visual areas, carrying the content of working memory, carrying the uh, plan of action that causes oscillations in those sensory areas, making them represent sensory information in their spike, spike timing. And this top-down signal is subject to be manipulated by the level of persistent activity uh, by, uh, via, via um, uh, dopamine-mediated activity within visual areas, within uh, prefrontal cortex, which also gives us this single take-home message that dopamine-mediated persistent activity directly sent from FEF to, to visual areas is the means by which PFC control sensory signals within visual areas, giving us a circuit level of uh, level understanding of why we always observe this link between attention and working memory. Now the picture is becoming more clear that okay, attention is the phenomenon of sensory enhancement. And uh, working memory signals sent from top-down areas to visual areas is playing a role in allowing sensory signals to be enhanced. Uh, which is probably a basis for why we observe uh, so, so much of a strong link in that between attention and working memory tasks at the level of psychophysics. And why, for example, we see that attention all facilitates the entrance of items into the working memory and items held in working memory are better processed. Also, it's important to note that the impairments that uh, uh, the, the mental disorders that are associated with imbalance in the level of prefrontal dopamine, for example, ADHD, schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, they are usually associated with problems of attention and working memory. And now with, with this picture, we have a very good understanding of why when we have problem in the persistent activity in frontal eye field, the neural signature of working memory, we should have problems in attention and neural signatures of sensory processing and sensory enhancement back, back in visual areas, giving us a picture of why an imbalance in the level of prefrontal dopamine is associated with problems of attention and problems of working memory, usually coincidentally together. So that's the general overview of what we are working on what, and what the large picture is. At the end, I would like to thank all members of our lab and our collaborators in various different labs. Specifically, what I presented today was the results of work of Isabel, Yasser, Mohsen, Zahra, with Dr. Daliri, and uh, Mohamed Reza and Ehsan's work that I just presented last part. And at the end, I would like to thank everyone for uh, their contribution, and uh, I'm open to take questions. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, my question is about. Uh, so I have two questions basically. Uh, the first question is about different cell types in FEF. So we have the we have visual cells, visual motor cells, and the motor cells in the FEF. 
<clears throat> what kind of cells? Uh, the, the, well, the first question is about <clears throat> response field of the visual motor cells. So, do, do the visual response and the motor uh, motor res visual response field and the motor response field in in FEF? Uh, do they match or do they dissociate or, or if, if you put the monkey in a task that uh, the visual, visual signal and motor signal are dissociated so like an, an anti-saccade task, uh, do they change their tuning from visual to motor phase or not? So, so most, of the, most of the FF neurons that we observe, they do match their visual field and motor field, but there are discrepancies between visual field and motor field as well. And that, that's a great question because I mean, I, it should be acknowledged that when we define FEF response field, we are defining based on the motor field technically, not during the recording, based on the stimulation. Exactly. So, yeah. So, so that that's a great question. But but generally, I would say in more than ninety percent of the cells that we record, we do observe um, consistency between visual delay, basically motor. Memory and and motor field. So visual field, memory field, and motor field are generally matched when we record a neuron. However, as you said, there are neurons that they don't show. So, for example, this neuron that we had in this example, right? So this has a visual field. I don't have the out condition, but the out condition is basically a flat line here. Right. But you can see that. Visual field and memory field are matched, but in this case, because the neuron was not a visual motor neuron, it was a visual and delay neuron, we did not uh, have a specific field for the, for the motor field, basically. But yes, generally, they are matching each other, and generally, uh, uh, yeah, the, the other part that I wanted to, to add was uh, Regarding the types of cells that you mentioned, what we observe in in this case is visual neurons or visual motor neurons are not specifically projecting to F to V4. Uh, the class that is specifically projecting to V4 is the one that has memory activity in it. And that was also the case for IT. We did not do the same experiment in IT. We did not do the collision experiment to figure out what is ex what type of neurons are oh, yeah. exactly yeah. sending information from IT to IT. In, in case of IT, we just recorded two areas that have overlapping receptive fields in, in FEF and IT. And for the rest of the slides, basically, all these slides that I talked about, for example, this, we are not finding specific neurons projecting from area A to area B. That was the only experiment that we did to, to trace a specific neuron. Uh, right. Thank you. And, and my second question is about uh, this recent paper that came out, I think, a month ago from Zabina Kostner's lab uh, that was about uh, uh, FEF and I don't remember another area. And uh, she, they were claiming that since FEF is a sensory motor area, based on the, the, the phase of the theta band and theta activity, theta oscillations. So the network is changing from processing sensory information and process, preparing planning motor output. So did you, did you see such a thing in your data or uh, did you at all, I mean, your, your uh, data match that, that explanation? So, so um, what, what, I, what I understood from your question is, um, you know, there, there are, yeah, how do I say it? There, there are two ways to think about it. One is, uh, if there is a, uh, if, if oscillation brings the system into a different state. Yes, exactly. That was the claim, yes. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's one way of thinking, and I understand that, that that's what Sabine is working on. Uh, I, I just want to note that the way that we are, at least seeing the system is, or at least studying the system is, it, it might be a different perspective. It, it may merge at the end. You know, all these nested coupling ideas that Sabine is following up these days, I think we are, we are going to merge at some point because the, the idea that's happening on, on our side is this, that there is a top-down signal that allows representations to be 
expressed relative to that oscillation. That is, that is the general idea that, that we are following here. That okay, if if there is a top-down signal that is shared between FEF and V4, for example, in this case, how does it help FEF gate re, gate information coming from V4 if if the oscillation between the two areas is shared? That is what's happening, and that is why we have conditions that we are present in working memory, interacting with sensory signal. I didn't present those type of tasks there. But I want to say that what is happening on this side is how having a common frame of oscillatory re reference helps FEF and V4 to communicate better. Then you can think that, okay, the step next to that is what Sabine is saying, which is, okay, how this phase-dependent representation is going to, to interact with a selection, for example, signal. Another oscillatory signal, for example, in the theta range, that is going to interact with this signal and allow it to, to be selected or not. That is what I, what I, how I interpret, the taking the oscillatory literature and adding the nested coupling idea to that, which is if there is a there is an oscillatory frame of reference for representation, how another oscillatory signal carrying the, the request for selection, for example, is going to interact with the current system and take it to another state to allow the signal to be used for a specific behavior or not. This is how I interpret it. So I don't see, let me put it this, I don't see any conflict uh, between between the two lines of thought, what what we are working mostly is how oscillation allows sensory areas to represent the signal, and then the the next step after that is that how different oscillatory signals coming could couple, and in terms of Sabine's terminology, nested nesting nested coupling with the current system to, to take it to another state or, or bring it back to another state. Right, thank you. And another quick question, if I may ask. The, the how, how did you dissociate, or maybe I didn't understand the task properly, the, like the timings of the task. How, how do you dissociate the motor signals, in a, particularly in, in FEF, from the visual signals? Because the monkey has to saccade into into the receptive field or out of the receptive field, and if the two the, the two receptive fields overlap, then how will you dissociate them? So, so in in uh, you, you mean this task, right? Uh, right. Yeah. Like, yeah, so, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. One thing is there is no stimulus on the screen when monkey makes an eye movement. So, so it's a memory task, meaning that monkey is making a saccade to a blank part of visual space. Okay. So right. in, in, in this case, we have a receptive field that a stimulus is presented there, and then there is no other stimulus throughout the rest of the trial in that, in that uh, neuron's receptive field. Okay? So, so by visual response, we mean response to presence of sensory signal or, or a visual stimulus in the receptive field of the neuron. That, that's what we mean by, by, by visual signal. Right. And by motor signal, we mean change in response of the neuron in the absence of any other visual, visual signals, visual stimuli. And if, for example, in this case we had, I mean, probably I better place other samples of neurons, my like other talks, but if, if this neuron, for example, would, would fire like that, then we would say, okay, there is an enhanced motor activity prior to eye movement which is a signal of, okay, preparation of motor plan independent of the uh, independent of presence of the sensory signal. All right. Right? So by, by motor signal, we mean enhancement of uh, firing rate before eye movement in the absence of sensory, sensory information. But you mentioned something really important, that we should always, because probably, uh, I mean, uh, this result, we should refrain from uh, over-interpreting it as, if there was a stimulus here, how would this neuron fire? 
You know what I'm saying? So right, if yeah. there was a ghost host there, it is likely that because because this is the signal of attention, we believe, it was probably possible to have a r- rise of activity right before the animal would make another movement to that uh, present stimulus because you know that there is presocratic activity in the presence of sensory signals in visual areas as well. So uh, this drop of firing rate is just motor signal. It is It cannot be interpreted as lack of overt attention signal in yep. FES. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. Mm. Uh, do you think there is something special about the, the, the dopamine receptors or there is something special about FES neurons that they have these receptors and they might have other receptors including uh, cholinergic receptors? So, so um, Maybe I, I better refer to what Amy Aronston is doing these days, which is what what their group uh, uh, um, is showing is persistent activity is mediated by uh, dop- dop- dopamine mediated activity, uh, and uh, but but what is what is also important is just the the internal, uh, the, the intracellular pathway for generating this persistent activity is going to be gated by uh, acetylcholine receptors. So actually, yeah, I mean, I don't have that, that figure right in front of me right now, but uh, what, what I believe is what, what, what is important at the end of the day is how uh, precise spatial uh, uh, um, uh, persistent activity is happening in frontal axial and achieving that would require an MDA receptors activity as well as you know, receptors and also uh, uh, acetylcholine is also modulating the intracellular pathway uh, uh, eventually to, to the influence of uh, uh, on persistent activity on ingestion. So, so what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, it, it, the modulatory role of dopamine and acetylcholine are not uh, separate and actually they, they are interacting with each other to generate persistent activity. But I think the answer is at the end of the day, what matters is the amount of persistent activity generated. Uh, if you have the retinotopy or, or, or clear response field or receptive field, have you tried to go further along the frontal lobe to go to the PHC and areas that uh, they don't have clear receptive field, but you know that they are all they are more probably are more involved or they are not. They are, they are also involved in cognitive functions like working memory, attention, but without any clear receptive field. Okay. I think for some reason when, when I go to that screen sharing part, it kind of reverberates there maybe. So okay. so I'll, I'll stay here. So my point was where the plan of action is memorized, as you pointed out, is probably likely to be a wider network of prefrontal areas meaning that pro-DLPFC and other parts are, are involved in maintaining that plan. But it is important to, to think of it as FEF as the proxy for prefrontal cortex to, to alter signals in visual areas. So, so I, I want to emphasize that I don't believe that the whole plan of action is memorized by FEF itself, but based on its anatomical connection and based on the fact that it is reciprocally connected with many visual areas. The general idea is that the plan of action memorized and maintained in the larger peripheral cortex is going to be relayed to visual areas through these direct connections of FEF, serving as the proxy of PFC to gate sen- signals in visual areas. So uh, in terms of your response, uh, yes, going further 
anterior and recording the rest of PFC is probably helpful for understanding what is really maintained, but I still think that if you want to see what is communicated between PFC and visual areas, you need to focus on FEF because that is based on the anatomy, that is the part that is reciprocally connected to visual areas and it's likely to be the, the part of PFC carrying signal, sending to visual areas in order to achieve behavioral goals. Okay, I see. Thank you. Dr. Rodos, thank you again. Yeah, I'm and, uh, Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for seeing that. Mm -hmm.